what is up guys and welcome to r slash tales from tech support <laughs> if you are new here please consider hitting that like that subscribe button and maybe even that notification bell if you like the content of course and let's get straight into it now we have a story from genesis 79 my computer is angry with me first time post here but i had this one in my repertoire for quite some time and i figured i'd share so Years ago when I worked in tech support for a popular dial-up service in the early 2000s, I get a call from a kindly sounding old lady who's trying to connect to the internet. However, her computer gets very angry with her when she tries to connect. Um, okay. I try to help her out anyway. I begin with, let's go over your settings. So I run down her setup checking the init string, a set of characters that determine settings for a modem. Maybe her dial-up modem was making weird sounds and freaked her out. Who knows? Then I get to her dialing number to the service, which typically is a local number to the user, who happened to be in New York. And I check it against my list and realised it was off by a couple of numbers. There, that should fix it right up. I could have just ended the call and asked her to call back if she had any other issues. But curiosity gnawed at me. I had to know. Mom, I have to ask, why did you think your computer was angry at you? Well, she says. When I try to connect, the computer gets quite angry and very rude and calls me all sorts of names like crazy bitch and demands I stop calling. I'm just trying to connect to the internet to check my mail. It dawns on me. Many internal modems have a speaker and tend to default to being so you can only hear the connection sounds. Hell, I got to the point I could diagnose that issue just by listening to it. So, this lady dials the wrong number in New York and this random guy, who's probably tired of his phone ringing over and over again, screams into the phone, Stop calling me, you effing bitch! <laughs> Which, of course, would travel right out of her computer case from the internal modem, instead of the usual squeals and pops in response. I mute for a moment to ponder my response and compose myself. I see, I managed to say without cracking my voice too much. Well, your computer has likely forgiven you now, and you can go and check your mail. Have a lovely evening, ma'am. In retrospect, I don't know if this guy assumed it was a woman calling him, or just calls everyone bitch. Perhaps months of getting that number wrong and squealing their computers in his ear has broke him. <laughs> I love the fact, the innocence of this woman, that she thinks her computer's gonna swear and get her. <laughs> From Mama, 16. The literal job I was hired for at my university is pressing the OK button on the printer when it is broken. I get paid $12 an hour to sit at a desk in the library all day just so tech support doesn't have to deal with the non-existent problems from students and staff. I call it common sense desk because every question I get is dumb. My primary interactions are student or professor. The printer is broken. I go to the printer. Print screen says, confirm print job. I press OK. Printer, prints. Surprise Pikachu face. <laughs> I would also like to note that there is a sign on the printer that says press ok to print. I think it's kind of hilarious and deeply sad that IT had to hire people for this position from 6 in the morning to 2am, but boy oh boy do I have endless amounts of tails. Edit, the printer is automatic most of the time, but occasionally needs that little nudge with the ok button. That's what really blows people's minds why I was hired. They can't comprehend even looking at the printer to see why it won't print, but hey. $12 an hour. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> Next story we have from Harry WWC. So you want to see Ellie's nipples? <laughs> Back in the 90s, I moonlighted as a friends and family tech support. My price was a cup of tea and a biscuit. Not a scone. You yanks misname biscuit. And no, not a cookie. These. I was young and stupid, but I'm feeling much better now. Anyway, a couple of us had purchased some new PCs from a closing down sale for the Aussie branch of the black and white cow machines. We got a P90 and they got a P75, all with DOS 6, Win 3.1, but also OS slash 2 warp disks if we wanted to load that. Still have the CD within reach. So the other guy, elder at my church, sets to Ellie McPherson in a wet t-shirt as his family computer background. His wife is cool with it. There's some stories there. And the kids don't really know much better at the time, although the oldest would become a constant source of phone calls from his parents over the next few years. All is well with a 15 inch CRT display, as SVGA 800x600x256 colours for a time. 
Then said Elephant decides after wandering across the dial-up internet, as it was the mid-90s, that if he ramps up the resolution and colour depth of the display driver, he would be able to see things under the wet t-shirt a little more clearly. <laughs> after all, if 800 by 600 is good, then 1024 by 768 with 16 million colours will be better. <laughs> I like his thinking. <laughs> So said genius sets Windows 3.1 to the new resolution and is required to restart Windows for this to take effect. Result? Blank screen. Well, not completely blank. A box floating around telling that the screen can't sync to the new settings. Reboots result in the same result. A phone call from his beloved, who is more than willing, with a certain amount of glee, to throw him under a bus. And I drive around. Restart the machine, kill the auto exec before it auto loads Windows and get a DOS prompt. CD in the Windows directory, fire up setup, and change the display back to what they should be. Double check in the doco, yes Virginia, actual manuals to read, to make sure that I got it right. Save the new config, yes I should have edited the win.ini, but didn't want to make a mistake there, and restart the machine to verify my settings took place. After a few moments, there was Ellie in her not super high resolution, glory. <laughs> I know it's insanely perverted. <laughs> There's some sort of like innocence there of some man <laughs> trying to get extra pixels on those nipples. <laughs> Next story is from Tidecon. Little picture of an aeroplane. I used to work support for an overseas phone network. It's important to note that we did support for the phone network, not actual phones themselves, but often the two lines would cross over a bit. I remember a particularly irate woman called once, swearing right from the off. My mobile's not effing working. I can't make any effing text or call or anything, calling us from our landline. Right, we'll see if we can figure out what the problem is. Of course, all the standard data protection stuff, just to make her more angry and irate, but we finally get through it. Okay, looking at your account, seems you have enough credit, so it should be working. Well, it's not. I can't send any messages. I'm not receiving anything. Nothing's effing working. What's the postcode you're in at the moment? It might be a problem with the signal. The country we offered support for pretty much only provided mobile cover for the outer edge of the country and nothing in the middle. Bonus points if you know which one this is. Ugh, here's my postcode. Well, there's no network issues in that area. You should get full signal there, so there doesn't seem to be an issue on our end. Well, it's not effing working at all. Nothing's effing working on this stupid effing phone. Okay, it might be an issue with the phone. Have you tried resetting it? Turning it off and on? Well, why would I effing do that? Because that fixes about 90% of the issues. It's always effing work before. That's what we just usually suggest to start with. Is it possible you've put the phone on airplane mode? Of course, this sets her off. I've never put it in airplane mode in my effing life. Why would I ever effing do that? That's such a stupid effing thing to do. No, of course I haven't put the effing thing in effing airplane mode. Effing airplane mode. Why would I effing put it in effing airplane mode? <laughs> Okay, okay. Can you look at the top of your phone and tell me what you see? Well, there's the time. Uh-huh. There's the battery icon. Mm-hmm. There's a little picture of an airplane. What do you think that means? Right. There's your issue. It's an airplane mode. Little picture of an airplane. <laughs> My top-up voucher doesn't work. I used to work support for an overseas phone network, and wow, there are some dim people out there. One memorable one I had... I just brought a top-up voucher from my phone and it's not working. I say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you have the code on the voucher? Well, why do you want the voucher code? I then say, so I can check if it's a valid voucher. Oh, right. It's 123456789. Well, I can see here that this is a valid voucher for $30 and it's not been used, so it should be okay. If you give me your mobile number, I'll apply it to your account. Oh, you won't find me in your system. I'm not with your phone network. So what phone network are you on? Then says an entirely different phone network. Didn't really know how to respond to this. Then why did you buy a top-up voucher for our phone network? Well, don't they all work the same? Why should I be on your network to top up with your vouchers? Ugh, I just want to top up my phone. Sorry, but you need to buy a top-up voucher for the phone network you're on. Well, you need to give me a refund for this one then since I don't need it. Oh sure, it was my fault that this bint doesn't know how to top up their phone. Sorry, I can't do that, but if you go into the store, explain the situation and give them your voucher and receipt, they might be able to help you out. Like how? <laughs> <laughs> Next story is from 
Now we have a story from Magortuga. Literally, just hold the power button. First time posting here, I pray I can please or at least amuse my tech overlords with this story of mine. I'm doing a tech internship at a tech company. Where I'm at, we mostly install windows and set up workstations, while the remaining departments provide the actual tech support. We also pick up malfunctioning equipment to take in, or fix them on the spot if possible. Me and my co-worker, CO, are going around the city picking up and delivering stuff along the way. Mind you, each location is like a 15 minute trip on the highway, away from one another. We arrive at a warehouse, where we're greeted by a lady. The lady says, thank you for coming so quickly, we got a PDA that's not working. CO says, this one, and picks up the PDA and fiddles with it. Yes, we've tried everything. Charged the battery, switched the battery with another PDA, tried turning it on multiple times. Nothing. CO then says, all right, I'll bring it in then. You'll probably have it fixed in a week. In the meantime, I'll try and get you a replacement, all right? Lady says, you see, we only have one working PDA now, and makes a gesture towards the tall shelves filled with packages, and I don't want to just have a single person working on all this. Don't you have any other clients we can borrow a PDA from? Yeah, I don't know. I have to see about it. Have a nice day. We leave. As we're getting into the car, co-worker hands me the PDA. We drive off. I say, so which one is the power button? The red one. I hold the power button in for 10 seconds. The PDA turns on. CO with a surprise Pikachu face. We do a U-turn. CO takes all the credit on the spot for fixing it. Talks about soft resetting and whatevers. We arrive back at our company and CO tells everyone I fixed it. Overall, that moment made up for me arriving home like two hours late. Now we have a story from Camrock929. There's a fire. No, really. I cannot believe it took me so long to find this subreddit. It's truly cathartic. Just reading through some old posts and was reminding me why I was glad to be demoted to regular support at my job. Some backstory, I work for a software company that's pretty small potatoes, but sells to big guys. We have a separate team for volume support, which is for corporations bigger than Joe Schmo, and consisted, at the time, of me and one other person who were not trained, just thrown into more complicated server-related support for the floating licenses. At this point, I know my software and the eeniest bit of server slash terminal stuff just to install my products. Q medium-sized company and their software engineer, otherwise known as SE. I've been working with this user for about a week at this point and I put their title in quotes because at some point I had to explain what CD stands for in the terminal so I'm not really sure what qualified them to be an engineer. They're the kind that takes 10 minutes to be convinced that they really do have to email in the information. It cannot be transferred over the phone and we'll get back to them after we confer with our engineer team. Then they send over the info and immediately start calling over and over. Eventually I just have one of the QA dudes on Slack chat and send him updates as soon as I get them to stop playing this phone game. I say, okay so it does appear as if, as if this debug log is confirming that the server machine is able to access the ports needed for client communication and the web GUI, but it is still unable to access the port needed for the ISV server. Again, this is dynamic and must be set to static if you require a specific port to be whitelisted. SE says, I told you already that we already opened the ISV server port. Again, if you chose a specific port, we need to set this to static in the license file as rebooting the server will cause it to change. But I already fixed that part. Our company is losing money because you can't fix this. I then say, since the server was rebooted, the port will be different. Can you tell me what port you chose to open so that I can set the license file to access the correct port? Whatever it was before, I don't remember. Can't you just set it to stick to the one the server is currently trying to use? We can, but then you'll need to change the server rules in your network. It will likely be easier for you if we can just set the license file to the port already open on your network. <sighs> hold on, I need to ask the network guy. I hold on, and I start to notice people getting up to look out the windows. Essie comes back and says, Okay, I have it. I'll send you the port number, but I'm waiting on the phone until I see the updated license file and it's working. I say, Actually, I'm going to have to call you back. The building is on fire. A very quiet fire alarm is requesting that we evacuate the building in the background. What? I need this file now! I'm very sorry, but I need to leave the building. I'll call you back as soon as I can. Unbelievable. Can't you just do this on your cell phone? Why do you need to be in the building? I'm silent. <laughs> Turns out it was the building next door on fire. We were back working within the hour. I now the customer sorted within 15 minutes from then. But I did love explaining to the head of volume wide why I didn't care that the customer put in a complaint saying that it took too long to resolve the issue. <laughs> it just reminds me of that meme there. 
and the dog sitting in the fire just everything is fine <laughs> now we have a story from potatoes are not cool customer's telephone line is inconveniently placed i work for a big isp as a manager in a call center today i got a request from a frontline agent for a customer looking to speak to a manager about moving the telephone line running to his house no other information m me manager c customer hi this is manager from isp you requested a call back about your telephone line you'd like it moved is it in a dangerous location customer says well no i've explained this before the cable runs above the window on my roof and birds keep shitting on the window because they sit up there and shit the whole day it's the only thing they do other than make noise and i demand this line is moved it's damaged my property and i will sue if it isn't moved I say, I'm sorry to hear that, but we really can't move the line. Your service works fine, and it's not a danger. We aren't liable for... the birds. You can have a third party move it if it's really such a concern, but we can't help. I am a lawyer. I know my rights. You have to move this, or I'll be dragging you through the courts. Like I said, we aren't moving it, and we aren't paying for someone to move it. I can direct you to a section on our website where you can find the mailing addresses of our head office, if you wish to make it a legal matter but the contract you sign has some pretty tight T and Cs that specify we don't move lines unless there is a danger. I want your manager. Uh, I am the manager. No, you have a manager and I want to talk to him. My manager doesn't work for the ISP. They work for this call center and arrange my timetable. The highest point of contact for ISP is me, unfortunately. You're welcome to send a letter to the head office. They are above me. I'm gonna have you fired. If you believe that will help, then by all means, you're welcome to try. Is there anything else I can do for you? You can move, <laughs> you can move the fucking cable, you cheeky bastard. <laughs> I'm sorry if I came across being cheeky. I just meant to be honest. If there's nothing else, have a great day. And end the call. I'm going to get an email in about a week from head office asking me to call this man because he has a complaint. Because all complaints said to have are handled by my team of three. So there's that. <laughs> Anyway guys, thank you for joining us today from this r slash Tales from Tech Support. If you did enjoy, please consider hitting that like, that subscribe button and that notification bell. And I will see you on the next one.